And I feel like that one of the things that God spoke to me before I came here, I was flying in here on the airplane and I was asking the Lord about this stirring. And this stirring's felt different for me and it even feels different for me sharing this message right now. I don't even know if I'm sharing the right message. But, um, but this, is, this, is what I, this is what I felt like I, I heard the Lord say. I felt like the Lord wants to increase our boldness. I feel, like, I feel like the Lord wants to teach us how to move in authority and how to, by faith, pull a reality into today that you might not have walked in before. To actually do acts of boldness because of the presence of the, of the Holy Spirit that's upon us. One of the main manifestations I can see throughout the scriptures, if you read Acts chapter 2, is when the Holy Spirit is poured out and there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, there immediately comes a boldness to proclaim the gospel. Boldness is one of the main manifestations. I love the gift of tongues, and that's, an, I know, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But it's not the only manifestation of the Holy Spirit when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes. Oftentimes, it's prophecy. Oftentimes, it's different things. But the, one of the main things I see is boldness to proclaim the gospel and power to be a witness. See, this is what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit will come upon you so that you can be a powerful witness. He says that in Acts chapter 1, the promise of the, of the Father is going to come to empower you to be witnesses. And I feel like the Lord wants to increase our boldness. How many people know there's more? Yeah. It's not meant to be just a one-time encounter. The, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just meant to be a one-time encounter. It's supposed to be a multiple-time occasion. I remember the first time I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk a few different stories to maybe stir your hunger for this. But I remember when I first got saved, there was a guy named Sean Downey. We called him the story man. When I went to that Baptist church, this, this young man had gotten saved in revival in Los Angeles, California. He was a, he was a uh, bass player in a secular rock band. And... Um, and they won the Battle of the Bands in California. And if you win the Battle of the Bands in California, then you get an instant contract. And at that time, then you got to open up for Maxbox 20, which means immediately you're in stardom. And so they had just won the Battle of the Bands. He's the, local, he's the bass player of that, of that group. And they have girls. They have money guaranteed coming. And he's depressed, and he's going to commit suicide. And the way he's going to do it, is he's going to take his little red car on the I-5, and he's going to take it as fast as it can go, and he's going to run it into the barrier on the I-5, and that's how he's going to kill himself. So he gets his car on the I-5, and he starts blazing as fast as he can on the I-5, and all of a sudden, this little red car pulls in front of him with a grandma driving it, cuts him off like they do in California, and there's this bumper sticker on it that says, Jesus is the way, follow him. So he follows this car all through these neighborhoods, and it's like going in and out and everywhere in this neighborhood. He's like, where is this lady going? He wants to ask her about her bumper sticker. She pulls into this uh, cul-de-sac in, in Los Angeles somewhere. It doesn't have a way out, just a cul-de-sac, and parks. So he gets out, and the old lady gets out. He gets out of his car. He's going to go ask the old lady about it, but he's distracted for just one second because he hears something to his left. He looks over, and there's a guy with dreadlocks on a, on a skateboard ramp on the top with a microphone preaching the gospel. And he's just, he's just distracted for just a second. He turns back and the car and the lady disappear. They're not there anymore. So he walks over to the skateboard ramp and the guy's preaching the gospel. He gives his life to Jesus Christ right there on the spot. And that's how he gets saved. And, and I'm in a Baptist church. This guy gets saved and goes into the military. His wife has an affair on him while he's at boot camp and leaves him. So now he's, he can't leave the military now. He's in it. And they station him in Norfolk, Virginia. And, and he's like, why, Lord? He's in all this pain. He's like, why? I go from revival land in California to Baptist land in Virginia. It's as cold as ice here. Why would you leave me here? And then the Lord tells him, go to this Baptist church that the Lord told me to go to. And now here's Sean, and he's telling stories about revival I don't know, they said, I just want to hear you tell your testimony. And he starts telling his testimony. Then he starts telling testimonies of divine appointments. I had never heard anything like this before. But my hands start tingling and burning as he's talking. I don't have a box for this, but my hands, I'm looking at my hands. It feels like they're asleep, but they're not asleep, but they're burning. And I hear the Lord. I'm like, what's going on? And I, I don't even know that I'm hearing the Lord. Here's the crazy thing. At that point, I hadn't gone to YWAM, and I don't even have the box that I'm actually hearing the Lord. Although I, somehow I knew it was the Lord. But I hear this thought in my, in my heart, what you once despised, I'm gonna use to bring healing to the nations. 
And see, when I was a kid, if you look at my hands, they're small and they're kind of wrinkly. They've always been like that, had dry hands. And they kind of, in my mind, they look like old man hands, you know? And I remember being on the bus as an as a, as a elementary school kid. And on the bus, it's like your mama jokes and all kinds of jokes on the bus on the way to and from school. And I remember I would never want my hands to be the object of somebody's um, jokes. So I would sit on my hands on the bus. And the Lord said, what you want despised, God's going to use to bring healing in to the nation. So I walked up to Sean after he was done talking, and I told him about my hands, and he just kind of looked at me with like a twinkle in his eye. And it's like, let's go to IHOP. And he's not talking about the International House of Prayer. He's talking about the Pancake House. <laughs> and, uh, and Sean just began to tell me stories. He never prayed for me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He just told me stories. And as he told me stories, my heart began to burn. My heart began to draw me in to the reality of what could be. And that's the thing I love about the stories that Dan's telling, the stories that uh, Paul and Justin and um, Kim are telling, is because these stories, they're, they're not just meant to be stories that wow you. They're meant to be stories that, that, that actually draw you to jealousy to have your own encounter in a good way, to, 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 to draw you to an expectation. The testimony the root word of testimony means do again. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what you're hearing is meant to stir something in you. And I remember Sean would take me out to IHOP and he would tell stories about when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He'd tell stories about when God would send him on these different assignments. And then I would ask him, I said, well, you had that baptism of the Holy Spirit encounter. I mean, can you pray for me? And I don't think he wanted to get kicked out of the Baptist church, so he would never pray for me. But he would say, I want you to read this scripture in Acts, and I want you to read this scripture. And so I started reading these scriptures. And then one day, I was in my uh, mom's condo, and nobody was there. She had just moved in. There was like no furniture, nothing in there. I was getting ready to go to YWAM, so I had moved out of my apartment. And I go there, and I'm all by myself. She's out for the night. There's no radio. There's no nothing in there. And I just start singing to the Lord a new song because I loved him. And I just, I just started singing to him. And as I'm singing to him, nobody taught me this. As I'm singing to him, boom, I'm on the floor. I'm laying on the floor and I try to get up and I can't get up. It's like somebody sitting on my chest. It's this weight that's on me. And I'm just singing, 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 singing. And, I, and I'm feeling the affirmation of God and tingles all over my body. And I'm crying and I'm weeping and I'm singing. And before you know it, I'm just making sounds out of my mouth. But I'm just singing different syllables. I didn't even know it was tongues. Years later, I went to YWAM and they were talking about tongues. I'm like, can you pray for me to get the gift of tongues? Because I didn't know. But I'm singing in the spirit as this is happening. And about this, I think it's like maybe 20 minutes that I was on the floor, but when I, when I got up, it, was, it had been two hours that I was on the floor singing. And I finally pull myself into the chair and I hear the Lord speak to me. He's, I, this phrase in my heart came to me and I just started weeping uncontrollably. He said, son, I'm proud of you, keep going. And I can't tell you the impact that hurt, had on me. If you heard my testimony yesterday, you know my dad's in and out of my life. But to hear him call me son, change me. I'll never be the same. Son, I'm proud of you. Keep going. And then I realized years later that on the day that Jesus was baptized with water and he came out and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, there's a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, the Holy Spirit is more than, like, like Justin said, just a blob or an it He's a person, and he's the guarantee. He's the down payment. He's the, he's the ring. He's, he's the promise of the Father, and he confirms in us our identity. The reason why, you, why we need these baptisms, the reason why we need these experiences with the Holy Spirit is, yes, yeah, so that we can do the stuff, but that also so that we can know who we are. We need to become friends with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who leads us and guides us in all truth. He's the one who trains and equips us. He's the one who opens up the scriptures. I mean, we can learn by teachings and everything that we want, but it's the Holy Spirit that makes it a reality in our life. And, um, and so then years later, I'm, I'm, I'm in YWAM. They teach me how to hear God's voice. 
His thoughts for me are more than the stars in the heaven, more than the sands on the seashore. And I'm already going to the streets and I'm practicing on the lost. As soon as I found out that I can hear God's voice and I started recognizing I've been hearing God's voice for a long time, I thought, if I can hear God's thoughts for me, then I can hear God's thoughts for you. So I started going to the streets and I started practicing. And the first place I'd go is to the ice cream store in downtown Chico and I would just practice on people. And I started seeing all these miracles uh, or salvations. It wasn't miracles at that point, but it was just salvations I was seeing through prophetic evangelism, because how many people know that prophetic evangelism is like an accelerant to evangelism? I used to lead people to Jesus buying a cheeseburger and sharing John 3.16 when I was with the Baptists. Which I think there's a message in that as well. It's part of the process thing that Paul was talking about. If you're faithful with what God gives you, he'll give you the more. I remember one time I heard the Lord say, the whole church is crying out for more, and I want them to have more than they want more. But what are you doing with what you've been given because he's a good steward? Come on. What are you doing with your last prophetic word? What are you doing with your last stirring conference? What are you doing with your last conference that you've been to? See, when Elisha got the double portion, the first thing that he does isn't go and show the mantle to all the other prophets. Look at my mantle. Look at my mantle. I got that prophet's mantle. What's the first thing that he does when he gets it? He picks it up and he goes over to the water and he slams it down on the water and he says, where's the God of Elijah? And the water splits this way and splits this way. So you think you get an impartation or an encounter. Well, what are you doing with it then? See, because if you're faithful with what he gives you, he'll give you the more. If you want to know how to accelerate in this stuff, be faithful with what he gives you. I'm just a Baptist boy. I don't even know the Bible when I first get saved. And I just start picking up homeless people. I picking up hitchhikers, taking them to Hardee's, buying a cheeseburger, sharing my testimony in John 3, 16, and they're giving their life to Jesus. Fast forward, I go to YWAM, I learn how to hear his voice. Is that really you, God? I start practicing. I start telling people what I feel like God's thoughts are for them. They start weeping and crying, how do you know me? I don't know you, but my best friend does. The Holy Spirit knows you. He loves you. He's calling you into relationship. Do you want to know him? And instantly, I start seeing from a few people getting saved to a lot of people getting saved. Fast forward, I go to Auburn, California, and I'm passing out these flyers to invite people to an open air crusade that this church is doing. And I look down at the flyer and the Lord says, this is a divine appointment for you. And I look down and it's a guy named Sean Smith that is gonna be preaching at this open air crusade. And the Lord says, this is a divine appointment for you. He's a black guy, he's from Stockton, California, an evangelist. I said, that's cool. I look across the street, it's like a, like a parade kind of environment, a celebration. On July 2nd, Auburn does this big, huge celebration before the 4th of July. And... Uh, all the people from Sacramento and everything come out to it. And so this church figures we're gonna leverage this event and we're gonna do an open air crusade here and we're gonna invite people. And so us as YWAMers, our job was to invite people to the crusade. And so I got this flyer, but I see this young girl across the street from the church's tent is a psychic tent. And I see this young, like 16 year old girl go into the psychic tent. And I say to myself, she's spiritually hungry. I'm I'm gonna wait for her to come out of the tent after she gets whatever this guy's gonna give and I'm gonna give her the word from the Lord. I'm gonna give her the word from God who knows her, who knit her in her mother's womb. And I'm waiting for her to come out. And as I'm waiting, this black guy comes up beside me and he says, hey man, what you doing here? I said, I'm waiting for this girl. I tell him what I'm doing. He said, no way, that's what I'm gonna do. (laughs) Turns out it was Sean Smith. So we have this whole conversation about multiple different things. And um, we're talking and whatever. He looks down at his watch. He's got five minutes that he's supposed to preach. And I'm supposed to be there too. This girl's not coming out yet. So we both have to leave before she comes out. He preaches the gospel message, which by the way is on peace. Paul says, he said, oh, the better evangelist. Now I think if Paul was to share that message on peace and at the end give an altar call, I think everybody in the room, even if you're saved, is gonna get saved. Amazing. But he shares the gospel of peace and two people get saved. Only two people. And one of them is that 16 year old girl. She moseyed in about halfway through his message and she gives her life to Jesus right there on the spot. And we get to both prophesy over her as an amazing encounter. But afterwards, I walk up to Sean and I said, I feel like the Lord told me that you're a divine appointment for me. Will you pray for me? He said, sure, I'd love to pray for you. He said, but let my son pray for you first. I'm, he was selling CDs out of the back of his car with like this little like uh, visa machine, this uh, random visa machine. He says, let me finish selling this CD. And so his son's praying for me. And I feel like the Holy Spirit, you know, goosebumps. You know, I feel good. I feel, you know, whatever. Nothing out of the normal. 
All of a sudden, I got my eyes closed, somebody's hands on my chest, somebody's hands on my back, and they start praying in tongues. Now, I don't have a box for this because I come from that Baptist background. I don't really have a box for this at all. But he starts praying in tongues, and boom, I go down in the crush and run gravel parking lot on my back. I thought they pushed me down because I didn't know what happened. I didn't feel electricity. I didn't feel wind. I didn't feel fire. I didn't feel anything. I'm just on the ground. And so I'm like, man, they must have tripped me or something. And I did everything that Dr. Randy Clark tells you not to do. You know, he tells you don't, don't, don't like courtesy fall or anything, but don't like resist the spirit either. You know, he t- teaches you, you know, you're, you're resisting the spirit if the spirit is wanting to push you down. And you're like, you see these people and they're like, mm, and they're like doing this. And like, don't do that. Like, like I did everything he told you not to do. I put my feet right. I played football. They're not going to push me down again kind of thing got my feet right. They prayed for me again. Boom, I go down again, and this time into a chair they had put behind me. Still, I didn't feel any, like, crazy electricity or anything. I just was in the chair, and I remember just feeling good. Like, I felt like the Lord was on it. Well, I went back to the streets right after that and did the same thing that I've been doing since I've been saved, talking to people about Jesus. The first person I talked to was a Vietnam veteran. I prayed for him, and he was completely paralyzed on the left side of his body from a stroke. I prayed for him and he was miraculously healed on the spot. He got up and started walking up and down the road. And it drew this whole huge crowd. I preached the gospel and people were getting saved. And it started this thing on Friday nights where people were like, can we go to outreach with you on Friday nights to Chico? And I'd be like, I don't go on outreach, but I do go get ice cream. You can come with me. And we went to go get ice cream and God always showed up. But there was this, There was this filling of God's spirit that happened, I believe, in my mom's condo that was this affirmation of of who I was as a son that did something in my identity that empowered me as a son. And then there was another one that I got this impartation, a baptism in the spirit, this impartation that happened where I began to move in power and prophetic evangelism. My prophetic evangelism went to another level. And then while I was going to the streets in Chico, because now all of a sudden, every Friday we're going to the streets and we're seeing people get healed, set free. We would start ministering and we got a reputation. So we'd start ministering on the streets. And before you knew it, we'd have 40 or 50 college students on the street. We had church on the streets, you know. We were prophesying, we are healing, we were interpreting dreams. And during the middle of this, Bethel Church sends a guy named Chris Overstreet to the streets on Halloween night because Chico was known for like being a party environment on Halloween. And so they would always send students and Chris to the streets. And while they're doing that, Chris comes down from Bethel and I see him coming up. I don't know anything about Bethel, but I see him coming up and I'm thinking, I'm going to share the gospel with this guy. And I walked up to Chris Overstreet to preach the gospel to him. And it was love at first sight, you know. (laughs) We connected and he invited me to Bethel. And before I know it, I'm, I'm following Chris onto the streets. And this is another place where I got an impartation. Dan talked about it just by, if you can see what I see, then you can have what I have. I started seeing him and the way that he would engage people, the way that he would activate the miraculous, and all of a sudden what he was doing became possible, and I just started copying him. Honestly, I just started doing what I saw him doing. I think one of the main ways that we learn is by observation, by repetition. I tell, I tell pastors everywhere I go in the, in the world, I say, you need to preach the gospel every Sunday, no matter if you know everybody's saved or not. Because by repetition, your people will learn how to preach the gospel. It's so crazy. You can come to an environment like this, and I can say, everybody stand up. I want, you've got two minutes to preach the gospel to the person to your left and to the right, and, and preach the gospel in a way that they can get born again. You only have two minutes, because oftentimes you don't have a, a long time to share the gospel with people on the street. So you got two minutes to share the gospel, stand up and do it. And if I was to do it in this room, which I don't have time to do it, 80% of the room wouldn't know how to do it. They've been going to church for a long, long time. They don't know how to share the gospel. If I was to say preach, they would know, even in our, in our stream, they would know how to, to, to get a prophetic word. They would know how to heal the sick, but they don't know how to preach the gospel. The Lord spoke this to me one time. He said, uh, if you present Jesus as a prophet, he'll, he'll encourage. If you present him as a healer, he'll heal. But if you present him as savior, he'll save. 
I think we need to begin to not only move in the giftings, and yeah, I understand love people without an agenda. I understand that. But at the same time, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how should they hear unless somebody preaches? And how can they preach unless somebody sends them? There is this, there is this thing of the gospel, understanding the gospel, understanding and meditating and, and dreaming about it with the Lord, making sure that your heart knows. There's this thing. I mean, I, I remember when I began to just think, I want to be able to win more people to Christ, not, not just so I can win more people to Christ, but because I see that as the way that the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. See, Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come with observation like it's over there or over there, but the kingdom of God is inside of you. Hey, I'm so excited that we're doing the stirring again. I'm, I'm going to be with my good friends, Paul Martini and John Prudian. Um, we've done stirrings all over the United States. We've seen countless miracles take place, um, pe- metal dissolving in people's body, tumors dissolving, people being healed of autoimmune diseases and cancer. We've seen hundreds of people saved, if not thousands of people saved. So many people equipped and trained. You know, the stirring... Um, was named by Paul Martini as he was praying and asking uh, the Holy Spirit, what, what conference do you want me to start? And the Lord says, you know, so many people have done so many uh, and gone to so many conferences and schools. They've, they've got a lot of giftings. They've got a lot of prophetic words. What they need to do is stir up the gift of God that's already been given to them through the laying on of hands. And so the stirring is all about personal ministry. It's about stirring up those giftings. And yes, you'll get more prophetic words. And yes, you'll get a lot of impartation. We've specifically structured the stirrings to have longer times of ministry. So there'll be training, um, there'll be long worship and, and long times of ministry just to minister to you and your family. And so I wanna invite you to come, be a part of the stirring. Let's get stirred up together and see Jesus get his full reward.